Hello, my name is Joanna Hambly. I work with Escape Trust at the University of St Andrews and we work with the public to discover, research and do projects at coastal heritage sites around Scotland. Boat graveyards are a class of heritage that we've encountered as through, through our wider activities and we're very good at understanding the big picture of what's happening with Scotland's coastal heritage but we know much less about local histories and heritage, which is why we work with the public. A lot of information and knowledge is held locally and it's very valuable to, to us to learn about it. And this is very relevant to the subject of boat graveyards. Now, this is a map of the only four known fishing boat graveyards in Scotland, three in the Murray Firth and one in Abilady in Fife. Unless you know of any more, which, and we'd be very pleased to hear from you. Except for Abilady, none were previously documented in national or regional historic environment records. However, of course, they were known about locally, and so people brought them to our attention during coastal surveys. Now, Loch Fleet is associated with Embo, Munlochy, of course, with Och and Fintorn was used by small fishing villages along the Murray coast. Now when I say fishing boat graveyards, I mean sites where there are visible remains of collections of vessels, so not just one or two, which you do find, although rarely, around Scotland. So these are the remnants of the first class wooden sailing drifters engaged in the herring fisheries in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And as they've fallen out of memory, various stories have been told about how they came about. So for Abilady, it has been suggested that the Earl of Weems, who was an amateur artist, had all the boats carefully placed to decay in picturesque positions to add interest to his view. And in the Highland region, a newspaper article in the 1990s about the boat graveyard in Loch Fleet said that after the First World War, due to so many not returning and the migration of the herring, the boats constituting the fleet of Embo were taken around to Loch Fleet and burned. Now, in fact, we found that it is generally true, that is generally assumed that fishing boat graveyards are a casualty of the First World War, which is partly true, but not the whole story, as you may know and as we will see. But it was this newspaper article that set us on our journey to try and get to the bottom of this dramatic story. Have a look at what was happening in the Scottish herring fisheries in our period, in the late 19th century and early 20th centuries. During the 19th century, a spectacular development took place in the fishing industry in eastern Scotland. As the Dutch monopoly over the herring fisheries in Europe declined, Huge markets for cured herring opened up, opened up in Germany and Russia and in the Baltic states. And the Scots, particularly the East Coast Scots, were well placed to take advantage of this. A traditional fishing population living in small villages, usually without harbours, catching white fish with lines from small boats in inshore waters, became increasingly involved in a seasonal herring fishery, which became ever more technical and capital intensive with the passage of time. So fishing rapidly transformed from a domestic industry, which was largely owned and controlled by fishermen, into an international industry organised through contracts with curers, who themselves were usually just the last link in a chain of merchants who could be based in Hamburg or Stettin and were operating via investors and banks in London and Edinburgh. So the result was a very rapid development of herring fisheries. The growth of the catch from the 1850s to the 1914 increased fivefold. And you can see from this graph that staggering quantities of fish were caught. On the left hand side, that's two and a half million barrels um, at the top of, top of the scale there. So initially this was made possible by the ever increasing size and efficiency of vessels and alongside that the curing yard, the development of the infrastructure and transport. So there was a step change in the size of boats. Until the 1860s most boats 
were had a keel of around 30 foot, but by the late 1880s, a 55 foot keel was pretty common. And of relevance to our story in the Murray area is the innovation of the Zulu, which accounts for most of the vessels that we find in boat graveyards around here. Further south, of course, the Fife held sway. So the Zulu was designed and built in 1878 by William Campbell of Lossiemouth, and it combined the straight stem of the Fife and the raked stone of the Scaffy. She had a narrow beam to create a very fast sailing boat. The Zulu could get to the fishing grounds faster than other vessels and get back from the fishing grounds and deliver the catch faster than other vessels. And it quickly became the most popular boat in northeast Scotland and was built in all sizes. Here's a wonderful photograph of a sailing Zulu in Aberdeen. I think that the registration is INS 73, which is a first class Zulu with a 45 foot keel owned by James Young of Hopeman. Now, these very large boats were made possible because of the technological leap into steam, which was used for the first time in 1883 to power capstans for hauling nets. And fishing communities were very quick to innovate. Everyone would want the latest boat and, and the latest technology. And you can see this in the records, including for Och, there's a very rapid jump at the turn of the 20th century from the smaller scaffies to the very large Zulus, and Zulus quickly became the dominant vessel type. Within 20 years, steam was being used as a means of propulsion for the vessels themselves. In 1900, the first Murray steam drifter, the Frigate Bird, was built in the Macintosh yard in Bucky. And this is my falling off a cliff slide. Just look at the impact of steam propulsion for sailing drifters. In the words of a commentator at the time, from 1905, there was a near mania for steam drifters. It was an absolute boom time in the herring fisheries. So how does this relate to our fishing boat graveyards? As boats got bigger, they couldn't be accommodated in traditional fishing villages with either no harbour or very small harbours. So we get the development of places, usually in tidal locks or creeks outside of villages, where seasonally used boats were laid up out of season. So here in Abilady are vessels belonging to probably Kukenzi, um, and boats could be laid up for, for quite a long time. So herring is, a, is very fickle. So if, if the herring fishery wasn't good, a boat could be laid up for more than one season. So Och is a very good example of a fishing village with an overcrowded harbour. This looks like a Zulu in the foreground with rows of scaffies hauled up on the beach behind. And I think this photograph dates from the turn of the 20th century because I think that that registration reads INS 2121, which would be the Iona registered to Alexander Mackenzie in Och in 1901. I'd be very interested if anyone knows more about this photograph. Uh, the Iona was deregistered well, in 1914, um, so she may be one of our vessels in Munlochy Bay. Now this graph is showing the total number of first class sailing boats registered in Och between 1895 and 1921. And we can see that for the first 10 years of the 20th century, Och was, had retained its first class sailing fleet. Now, this is largely because at the turn of the century, turn of the 20th century, many of the older, smaller scaffies have been replaced by newer, larger Zulus, often under shared ownership, in fact, mostly under shared ownership, because these were much more expensive boats. Now, the average lifespan of a wooden fishing boat is 10 to 20 years. So eventually, the time will come when a boat would need to be replaced. By 1911, 1912, we're well into steam mania. But a steam drifter was at least twice the cost of a sailing drifter. And also needed a harbour to keep it in. You can't lay up a steam drifter in a in a in a tidal lock. 
So the cost and the lack of facilities for smaller fishing communities put them out of reach of most fishermen from them. And the herring fishery became concentrated in the large harbours with good facilities. And this is really when our boat graveyards came into being. They're a result of piecemeal, unintended abandonment due to a whole range of, range of interconnecting factors, mostly technological and macroeconomics, and finished off by the impact of the First World War. So these boat graveyards all had a previous history as safe havens for fishing communities without adequate harbours, which was most of them on the east coast of Scotland, where the large herring drifters were not fishing, they were laid up in quiet reaches of the Murray Firth. So in this photograph, you can see that Fintorn is being used by Banff and Bucky registered vessels. This probably dates from the late 19th century, and these Zulus are laid up waiting for the season to start. 20 years later, the same view, these boats lying at every angle will probably not sail any anymore. And the one in the centre has actually lost, lost her top rail. 20 years later in Loch Fleet, this photo captures a couple of Embo first class scaffies in quite an advanced state of decay. The one on the left is registered to Hugh Ross of Embo in 1886 and was last on the registers in 1904. So by the time this photograph was taken, it had been lying here for 30 years. So let's have a look at what survives in the archaeological record. We'll go first to Loch Fleet. And the south side of Loch Fleet was used as a safe haven by the fishing village of Embo, which at that time had no harbour or pier. We found 17 vessels in Loch Fleet. 11 of them were third, had 30 foot keel or over, so were first classed. One of these had a 45 foot keel or over. Six were Zulus and 10 were clinker built. So when, we, when we're looking at a site, uh, the elements that survive are those mostly below the green line on this slide that have been preserved by ballast and also in the mud. So the keels and keelsons, which is very useful to assess the size of the boat in its class, the floors. Quite often you'll find a rudder fallen on its side, flat on its side, and also a stem post fallen on its side. Bits of planking. Um, Above the green line, we just find the most robust bits, so metal, metal elements such as a boiler, very occasionally a capstan, and elements like ram's horns on the stem post. So this is what Loch Fleet looks like on the ground. There is a ram's horn on a stem post and a rare steam capstan. This one was made in Fraserburgh, I think I recall. And we record all these vessels very traditionally. We draw them and make a note of what elements survive. And we also use a lot of drone photography or aerial photography these days to make overall plans. So we're just going to zoom in on these two here. And the one on the right hand side does look very much, you can see the scaffy shape of the, of the stem post, a slightly curved stem post. These two vessels are in exactly the same position as the vessels that we've seen earlier in that 1930s photograph. Now you see the registries of sea fishing boats held in the Wick archives and we were able to identify most of these vessels. Also, some of them were identified by people who told us about them, for example, the Violet. So next we go to Fintorn, and the vessels using Fintorn, vessels using Fintorn have Banff and Bucky registrations, and they would have been owned by fishermen in the very many tiny fishing villages along this coast with either no, no harbour or only tiny harbours. 
Now we documented at least 30 boats in Findhorn, 14 of which were represented by timbers and the rest of them just by ballast mounds. And they're all laid up on the Colbin side of Findhorn Bay. And if I use, I'm going to use our aerial photography to zoom in on, on some of the boats so you can see what they look like on the ground. This is panel cluster which is well preserved and you can just start seeing on the left hand side on the beach these are the ballast mounds so under each of those mounds is a is a vessel but we don't know them survive but you can just see in the bottom left you can see the keel um, uh, just visible emerging out of the ballast mounds the three vessels though are very well preserved and you can just start seeing the boilers in the front of the, oh no, sorry, in the rear of each vessel, and take a closer look at those. Lots and lots of timber elements surviving. This is the boiler and the firebox for the capstan. Uh, now these, which the, this is the only firebox that we've recorded that's surviving. These boats are huge. Seven of them had keels that were well over 55 feet. They're identifiable. All of them were carvel built, so that's edge-to-edge -edge planking, which you can see very clearly in this photograph, except for this one. So this vessel has a 53-foot keel, a steam capstan, as you can see the boiler for. And when you look at the frames, you can see that they're joggled for to halt for a clinker built vessel and there was also a little bit of planking surviving that confirmed it was a clinker built vessel. So this at the time we thought this was very unusual because Edgar March in his bible um, of book of uh, sailing drifters tells us that once a vessel gets to over 43 foot, an over 43 foot keel and after 1885 you really don't see clinker construction anymore. It's all carvel. Um, so this vessel differed from that. And at the time, we thought it was unusual. So now we come to Munlochy Bay and Och. And this site became known to us by chance from a gentleman who now lives in the Milton of Culloden. He's in his 90s. And he lived with his grandparents for a few years in Och in the 1930s. And he just mentioned in passing, we were talking to him, and he mentioned in passing about the Zulus that were visible in Munlochy Bay when he was a boy. So we were interested in his story, and we went and visited the site the next day, and we were really um, amazed at, at the level of preservation of, of the vessels in Munlochy Bay. So we came back a few weeks later and just made a very rapid record of the site with volunteers. So we recorded 11 vessels, seven of them were over 45 foot and five of these were clinker built. Isn't that interesting? So many more examples of very large clinker built vessels. Now another interesting thing about Munlochy Bay is that there could be um, surviving elements to show that it was quite a formalized beaching site. Um, on the west side there's a line of boulders that go right out into the intertidal zone and on the right hand side there's just a, a small stream that comes out into the bay and all of the boats are located between, between those two features. So here are the boats. Number 11 is actually dodgy, that could be just a piece of timber so I, I think there are probably only 11, 11 vessels there. If we just start zooming in on the boats, just to have a look at what survives. Here's number two, and you can see at the bottom of the picture the very distinctive raking stern of a Zulu. We've got the keel and keels in there, um, a mast step, uh, lots of bits of frames lying about. And going along a bit, another very similar example. Here you've got some of the deadwood of the of the stem post just underneath the, the number five surviving. And then on the west side of the site, this vessel where you've got 
more mast posts and some of the planking surviving. I don't know if you can see, but that planking is overlapping, so that tells us immediately that it's a clinker built vessel. So here's a photograph of vessels eight and nine, just so you get a sense of the scale of them as well when, when there's people walking on them. All of our vessels in Monlocky Bay retained their ballast except for this one at the bottom. So you get a sense of what could survive underneath the ballast. And there's a, quite a lot of the hull planking surviving on this one. And this is a carvel built boat. We found three artifacts on the site from boats eight and five. And these all date from the first quarter of the 20th century. There's a sherry bottle, which I quite like, quite like the idea of the fishermen drinking sherry when they're out fishing. A soda water bottle and then a, a, a very nice large spongeware mug. And these give us a very good indication of the date when the vessels were, were last used. These graphs also give us information about the Munlochy boat graveyard. The top slide we've seen before, it's telling us that over the first decade of the 20th century, Och maintained its first class sailing drifters. The bottom graph is showing us the final year of, the re of registration of first class boats. So in 1900, 18 vessels left the register, but the total number of first class vessels didn't go down in Och because these were the older, smaller boats that were replaced by the much larger Zulus. Over the next 10 years, numbers are pretty steady because the fleet is relatively new and in good condition. And the odd few that were deregistered, um, some were replaced, some weren't, but it didn't affect the numbers so much. By 1912 to 13, however, boats were not being replaced. And we now know that this is because this is in steam mania. And so fishermen were not investing in steam drifters to replace their aging wooden sailing drifters. And you can see that in Och, there really is a free fall after 1915 when, when sailing boats were not replaced. So I think in Och that the war is definitely a factor. There's very valuable information for Och written by David King Sutherland in his booklet, The Fisher Law of Och in the 1980s. And he says that up to the First World War, there was a sizable fleet of Zulus at Och. Gradually, the sailboats gave way to the steam drifters and motorboats. And between the wars, memory only recalls the last few remaining. Violet M. Hope, Mizpah, always painted green, Press Home, Bird of Freedom, Begonia, and Mindful. Some of the tummers for the old Zulu fleet can still be seen where they were beached for the last time below the captain's wood at Munlochy Bay. And I would like to add to this, these vessels that fell off the registration in 1914 and 15, and so some of which could be our vessels in Munlochy Bay. And I would just love to hear from anyone who knows about the biography or the stories of some of these boats. What happened to them? Were they sold on? Were they broken up? Uh, are they in Munlochy Bay? So to conclude, We've learnt that all of our fishing boat graveyards are located in tidal lochs. They're used by fishing communities with inadequate or no harbour facilities to lay up their large herring sailing drifters out of season. Against the backdrop of increasing costs and as sail gave way to steam, boats laid up one day were simply not taken out anymore. So they're not deliberate discard sites. However, they are incredibly rare survivals of a once ubiquitous way of life in parts of Scotland. In 1900, there were over 6,000 first class sailing drifters in Scotland. Today, only four or five survive as seaworthy or potentially seaworthy vessels.
and there are less than 100 in total in boat graveyards or in ones and twos scattered around the coastline that we know about. So you might ask why they're so important when so much has been written about the herring fisheries. Well, the remains of the boats themselves, their archaeology, does show us different stories and local variations. So we've seen that the clinker method of construction is persisting in very large boats for much longer than was is assumed or was once thought. And I haven't discussed the timber yet, but we also find a, quite a lot of variation of, the, of timbers used, especially the use of larch instead of beech and oak. And oak. So again, that's telling us something about, about resources and how, how people are just adapting to what they have. As these maritime cultures go beyond reach, it's the physical remains of these, bo these boats that allows people to connect with them in a different way and to rediscover or reawaken an interest in their significance and their history. But not for long, as the vessels themselves only had a 10 or 20 year at most sailing career, so the timber remains, deteriorating now for over a century, are disappearing from view. And um, before I leave you, I have a few questions I'd like to leave with you to think about. Um, I'd be so interested if anyone would contact me if they have any information at all about all of this. Um, firstly, we would love to know more about just how the Munlochy Bay site worked. How formal was it? Was there an agreement with the landowner? Uh, did you have to pay to leave your boat there? For example, we know that boats were hauled up in Castleton Point. So how did that work in relation to Munlochy Bay? Were boats left in Munlochy Bay for longer periods of time than at Castleton Point, for example? Or did people would people just trying to avoid the 10 shilling cost um, to get their boats hauled up by the, by the steam engine? What is your memory of the fishing boats in, in Munlochy Bay? Do is anyone is there anyone out there who has photographs of them in like the 60s, 70s, 80s? How long did they look like boats? Um, and of course, we would love to know if anyone has information about which boats are there. Do you know anything about who built Ox Sailing Drifters? Was there a favoured boat builder? Um, could this explain why so many of the vessels are clinker built, for example? Are they all coming out of the same yard? We'd also love to know what happened next after the war. How did ox fishing families adapt after the war? How did fishing change? What, what new boats were, were adopted? And I would love to hear from families who were involved in the herring fishing in Och or who are ancestors or who have ancestors who were involved in it. Um, so names that just, you know, really dominating the ownership uh, uh, and skippering of the boats are Patience, Jack, McLemon, McIntosh, Sutherland, Reed, Skinner. Um, I'd love to hear from you. And finally, I haven't talked at all about Bay Quarry Harbour in Munlochy Bay, but you know there are boats, there are at least five vessels we think in Munlochy, in, in the Bay Quarry Harbour. So if anyone knows anything about those vessels, we'd love to hear from you. And you can contact me at that email address. Thank you very much. <laughs>